University Police Tax Security, open my office. Hi, um, I, I would like to request a um, some help from my daughter, who's a student at University of Utah. And I think they're trying to lure me somewhere. I'm worried that he's dangerous. I filled out a report for the um, the threat. I don't want her to go there by herself and have yeah. like something bad happen to her. Yeah, I'm worried because I've I've been working with the campus police um, at the U. Uh huh. And uh, last Saturday I reported and I haven't gotten an update. And then I just hear her yell no no no, and then she must have gotten tackled or something because I hear some noise and uh, the phone fell to the ground and then I kept calling for her and she didn't answer. She was abducted while we were talking to her on the telephone. But maybe somebody yeah. found her backpack. Someone picked up her phone and backpack. Hello and welcome to True Crime Unveiled. My name is Jen and I appreciate you being here. We are going to talk about the tragic murders of Lauren McCluskey and Jifan Dong. Both were murdered at the University of Utah and their deaths could have been prevented had the university followed its own protocol. During the first part, we are going to discuss Lauren's story and the tragedy behind her murder and then we will move on to Jifan's story. But before we start, I want to thank all of my subscribers. I really appreciate your support. And I also want to thank those of you who just happened to click on the thumbnail. And if you are the latter, please consider subscribing. It is free for an unlimited time. I also want to announce that I am currently working on setting up my Patreon, and I am also working on possibly getting some merch started. In order to continue creating content, I unfortunately need to be able to afford to do so. So consider supporting me on that. If you can afford it, of course, don't ever feel obligated. If you can't, I know because I am there right now. I really hesitated starting the Patreon, but honestly, it is so expensive to get documents nowadays. The state has figured out that they can make a ton of money off of these court documents, these public documents, body cam footage, and they are doing it. For those of you that have been subscribed to me on YouTube, you'll notice that my intro is a little bit different today, and that is because I am I'm also going to be starting a podcast. So lots of changes are going to be happening for the channel since I have rebranded it to expand my content. All right, so now for the necessary but completely boring disclaimer, which is pretty much in my description box, but nobody reads that. So I'm going to go ahead and do a verbal one. And aren't you glad there are timestamps below in the description box if I remember to add them? Even though I'm an alumni of the University of Utah, I speak only on behalf of myself. My intent is to shed light on institutional failures. It is not to villainize the University of Utah nor any of its employees or representatives. I feel like it is very important to also look at the institutions and structures around these crimes. We can learn from those and change policies and the way we approach these horrible crimes. This is also a commentary channel, though, so I will be sharing my own personal opinions for legal purposes because. Because I can't afford to get sued. Lawyers are fucking expensive. Any footage or images, audio that I use in this video are done so with the intent to fall under Section 107 of the Fair Use Act and that I am using them for educational and commentary purposes only. However, if you are the copyright owner and you feel I have violated that, please contact me at the email below in the description box and I will do my best to work with you to rectify that. Please don't just put a random copyright strike on my channel. It hurts and it also is very detrimental to me and other small creators who are still trying to grow our channels and do not have the financial resources that larger creators have. And on that note, please support smaller creators whenever you can. All right, so that's enough of that bullshit. Let's move on. Lauren Jennifer McCluskey was born on February 12th, 1997 in Berkeley, California. When she was about a year old, her family moved to Pullman, Washington. Pullman is a town on the eastern side of Washington near the Idaho border with about 35,000 residents. It is also home to Washington State University where Lauren's parents are professors. Her mother, Jill, is an economics professor and I believe she actually heads the economics department. So good 
for her, there are not enough women in economics. I can tell you that. Her father is a physics professor. Now, according to Lauren's mother, she walked at a very young age, nine months old. And by the time she was a toddler, she was climbing trees. So she was very active. Lauren became an accomplished track and field athlete. She excelled at the hurdles and high jump and competed in the Junior Olympics at just eight years old. Lauren earned a USA track and field title 19 times in her career and set many records along the way. One of her coaches later described her as an extremely dedicated athlete. In fact, Lauren would travel 150 miles round trip to train with him. Lauren also loved animals. She had two cats of her own, one who she named Fuzzy and the other Victory. In addition to volunteering at the Humane Society, Lauren also volunteered for the YMCA and Special Olympics. While competing for Pullman High School, Lauren broke the school record for the 100 meter hurdle. She was also state champion her senior year for the high jump. Upon graduation, Lauren accepted a scholarship to the University of Utah track and field team. The University of Utah is nestled at the foot of the Wasatch Mountains in Salt Lake City, Utah, and has has about 35,000 students and God willing, hopefully one less in the spring of 2023. University of Utah alumni includes LDS Church presidents. Martha Raditz and Carl Rove also attended the university, though they did not graduate, as did Ted Bundy, who did not graduate either, but went on to have, well, we all know what happened. <laughs> While at the U, Lauren majored in communications. She had a 3.77 GPA and envisioned a career working in public relations or academic advising. On the track team, Lauren competed in multi-events and the high jump. She was ranked 10th of all time for the pentathlon. I have no idea what that is, but I assume it's pretty awesome. Some would describe Lauren as quiet, but she was also very fun-loving. She loved to dance, sing karaoke, and hang out with her friends. At the beginning of her final fall semester at the University of Utah, Lauren and her friends decided to go downtown to a bar known as London Bell. While at the bar, Lauren met a security officer or bouncer by the name of Sean Fields. During their conversation, Sean told Lauren that he was 28 and a student at a local community college studying computer science. The following day, Sean called Lauren and they arranged a date for that afternoon and within a week they were dating exclusively. Sean became a regular visitor at Lauren's residence hall. In fact, the other students soon started to recognize him. He seemed very friendly and outgoing. Less than a month after they started dating though, Sean started to become possessed of Lauren and her friends noticed there were behaviors in Lauren that they hadn't noticed before. Sean seemed to constantly be around and he was always calling and texting her and Lauren in response would have to answer him right away. Her friends started to notice that she looked tired. She also appeared to be losing weight. Their worries only increased when Lauren mentioned that Sean had told her she couldn't hang out with her friends. If she was hanging out with her friends, he wanted a picture of who was with her and where she was. In a lawsuit filed after Lauren's death, it was noted that friends had also noticed bruising on Lauren's body. After witnessing Sean's controlling behavior and the changes that were occurring with Lauren, one of her friends, who was also an RA at the university, became concerned enough that she reported the situation to supervisors. She was also concerned because Sean had told Lauren that he wanted to bring her a gun on campus for protection. Now in Utah, guns are legal pretty much everywhere, and it is not illegal to take a gun on a college campus. However, it sounded like Sean was just going to bring Lauren a gun without the proper permit or licensing. Last year, the legislature passed a new law which no longer requires any concealed carry permits. So you don't even have to have that anymore, but you did in 2018. According to several of Lauren's friends, this wasn't the only time Sean would talk about guns. He actually would talk about them all the time. Shortly after they started dating, he'd even taken Lauren shooting. When Lauren's friends brought up to housing staff their concerns and the fact that there may be an unauthorized gun brought on campus, housing supervisors 
seemed to brush them off. They said that they would have a meeting to talk about it later, but it seemed like every time her friend followed up with them, she was told, oh yeah, we're going to talk about it. So they didn't seem to be taking the concerns very seriously. When a member of the housing staff did write up a report, she stated, I was prepared to call University of Utah Police, UUPS, and go to the apartment that night, but Redacted advised me to wait and talk about it the next day. On October 1st, however, the housing staff were told they needed to do something immediately. The concerns surrounding Lauren's relationship with Sean had elevated, and her friends were really worried about her. At that time, housing staff did decide to submit what is called a care report, but unfortunately, the system was down and it was never submitted. The independent review conducted after Lauren's murder would later note these failures by housing staff. In addition, they would note that the concerns should have been passed off to campus police or a campus behavioral team known as bit. However, even though housing staff knew about the concerns surrounding Lauren and Sean, they chose to focus on the housing violation of Sean staying in Lauren's dorm. And that was more of their concern than the possible domestic violence situation and the fact that Lauren was showing signs of being in that type of situation. A couple of days after staff were warned that they needed to submit this report and that something needed to be done, Lauren caught a glimpse of Sean's wallet and she noticed that his license had a different name on it and a different age. It said that his name was Melvin Rowland and that his age was 37. Lauren turned to Google and soon found out that Melvin Rowland, as his name was, and we'll call him Rowland from here on out, was a registered sex offender. His last offense involved a 13-year-old girl. After discovering this truth, Lauren immediately knew she had to break up with him. He had a long record. In fact, he had spent 10 years in jail jail for crimes related to sexual abuse and enticing a minor. He was scheduled to stay in jail until 2019, but he had been let out early on parole. On the night of October 9th, after spending a few days up in Washington, Lauren returned to her dorm and contacted Roland and told him that she needed to meet him right away. While Lauren was waiting for Roland to show up, she was on the phone with a friend and became frightened when she noticed Roland had arrived and was actually peering through the window at her. He appeared to be stalking her. Lauren hung up the phone and at that point she confronted him and broke off the relationship. Roland did not respond well to this. He claimed that he had been framed and it wasn't his fault. He was adamant that they needed to stay together so he refused to leave that night and the following morning Lauren lied to him and told him that she had track practice but that he could borrow her car just to get him out of her dorm. It was later that morning that Lauren started receiving harassing texts messages. At the time, she thought these messages were from his friends, but later it would be found out that these text messages were actually from Roland using a spoof app. These messages were quite disturbing. Some of them told her to go kill herself. That afternoon, Roland and Lauren decided to meet so that he could give her back her car. They were going to meet at the stadium. However, during this time, Lauren had called her mother and told her about the situation, and her mother became very concerned for her safety. So she actually called the University of Utah Police. University Police National Security open my office. Hi, um, I, I would like to request a um, some help from my daughter, who's a student at University of Utah. Okay. Um, what is the situation exactly? What does your daughter need help with? Okay. So, um, so she was dating someone who's not a student and, um, and he um he has her car Sorry. and um he's sp- he has her car okay and um, he's supposed to return she broke up with him and he's supposed to return it to the um to the parking lot at the stadium uh-huh and i'm worried that he's dangerous okay um we can definitely have someone help her out can you have your daughter give us a call can can you guys call her um yeah what's her phone number okay it's zero zero so so Okay, so let me tell you just a little bit more. Um, so he was lying to her, okay. and he's actually a sexual 
a friender. Okay. And and um and lied about his age and things like that. Okay. And then he has her he has her car and he wants her to return he one of his friends wants her to return the car to the stadium parking lot at five o'clock. And since it's um since it's fall break, a bunch of her friends aren't aren't there, so I'm worried she's gonna go there alone and someone's gonna hurt her. Definitely. Okay. Yeah, and you said uh, the area code is uh, and what was her yeah, name? Yeah, so she's she's an out of state. She, her name is Lauren McCluskey. She was on the track team. She's an out of state student, and she she started dating this guy there, who's like a bad person. Okay, and Let, she found out he's a bad person, and she broke up with him, and he has her car. Definitely. Let me give her a call real quick, and we will figure something out. Okay. Okay. So I just like someone to to. Um, to accompany her because if I'm her friends are out of town, she I don't want her to go there by herself and have yeah, like something yeah. bad happen to her. Definitely, I will give her a call. Um, did you want me to give you a call back or or? Like, yeah, if you could give me a call back, that'd be good. Okay, what was your name? Jill. Jill. I'm also Okay. Hi, oh, oh. Perfect. It's gonna be okay, Jill. Let me let me give Lauren a call real quick and figure something out with her. Okay. Because that that would be totally easy for us to send someone with her. Um, I wouldn't want her to go in and go in into a bad situation by herself. So okay, let me give her a call real quick. Yeah, no problem, Joe. I will give you a call back in a little bit. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Bye bye. Uh, initially, the dispatcher made a call to Lauren, who declined any help because she said that instead of the stadium lot, that Roland was going to be returning her car in the parking lot near her dorm. Hello? Hi, is this Lauren? Yeah. Hi, this is University Police. I got a call from your mom about, um, I guess, a car drop-off that you're going to be doing or someone dropping off your car, and she was a little bit worried yeah. about it. Um, I was wondering if I can ask you a few questions and then maybe send someone with you or have someone meet you there when you're going to drop off the car. Okay. Um, well... So uh, I think the car will be dropped off. Okay, so so she uh, said it was your, your ex-boyfriend's dropping off your car. Going his friend, yeah. Okay, and sorry, he's dropping off where? At first it was going to be at the stadium, but uh -huh. um, he was asking to drop it off at my place. So okay, um, I might just have it dropped off at one of the buildings in my mind. Do you live on campus? So, yes. Okay, and um, where do you live on campus? I'm assuming it's at the dorms. Okay, do you feel comfortable with him doing that? I know your mom was really concerned about it. Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's okay. Okay, because if it's all right with you, I mean, we're here 24-7. I'm super cool. You could come hang out here and have him drop it off here. We have where? a parking lot on the east side of our building. It's the police department on campus. It's right by the South Tra Stadium tracks. So we could even have... Um, a security officer pick you up at your dorm and drop you off here so you can wait here for him to leave your vehicle. Especially, I mean, it mm -hmm. sounds like, I, I mean, I don't know how you feel about the situation. I don't want to misinterpret just based off of what your mom was saying, but she definitely seemed worried about it. So if you wanted to and you felt comfortable, you could come hang out here with us. I mean, it's just a bunch of college kids here. I mean, there's some adults, obviously. We work for the police, but, mm -hmm. you know, you can come hang out with us when he drops it off, or um, I know she wanted someone to be there with you when the car gets dropped off, which would definitely make me feel more mm -hmm. comfortable about that situation, um, but I don't want to put you out of your comfort zone. I know that's kind of weird, especially if you haven't dealt with the police before. Just having an officer hang out with you while someone drops off a car can be weird. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think I think I just want to have it dropped off here, but... Okay. I'll call if I need to. Well, okay. Um, is it all right if I have a security officer at least in the area when it's getting dropped off in case you need anything? Yeah, that, that sounds good. Okay. And what time is it getting dropped off? Uh, five. At five? Yeah. Okay. And this is, uh, what building did you say it was again? Uh, Okay, I'm looking at my map. It looks like the closest parking lot is the parking lot kind of in front of 825. It's like kitty cornered. Yeah. Okay. Does that is that going to be the closest parking lot? Do you think? Yeah, I think so. Uh, and what type of car is it? It's a Jeep Liberty. It's green. 
Okay. And the guy who's dropping off, what's his name? And his last name? Um, I'm not sure what's his last name. Sure, you cut out a little bit. Um, let's see. I'm not sure what his last name is. Okay. Do you know, is he a student on campus? I don't believe so. Okay. All right. So I will give my security officers just a little bit of a heads up in case you need anything. Um, okay. And we'll go from there. If you change your mind last minute or anything like that, we have some really cool security officers. We have some new, um, we have a couple of new cops on campus that are always looking for like extra stuff to do while they're finishing up their training. Um, anything like that, you just let me know, Lauren. Um, my name is and I'll be here until 6 p.m. Okay. So if you need anything, just let us know. Um, it's the only other person working with me, so if you give us a call back um, and let us know, uh, we can send someone out to help you or, you know, anything you need, especially if the situation gets uncomfortable. Please, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, Thank Mark. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hi, this is Campus on 12. Hey. Hey. How are so, you? So, sorry, this is... I'm barging in on this call because I'm the one who wanted you to call. Um, so I wanted to make you guys aware of a situation tonight at um, okay. This girl doesn't want officers to respond, and she didn't want to come down here, but her mom called to tell us about it. I guess her ex-boyfriend is dropping off her car there because they okay. broke up, and he needs to leave her car there at 5 p.m. I think it's lot 73. This girl doesn't want police to go to do a keep the peace or anything like that, but her mom said that her ex-boyfriend's actually a sex offender and he lied about his age and lied about being a student on campus and all this stuff. So she said at 5 p.m. she would like someone to be nearby in case something happens, but this girl, her name's Lauren, she said she doesn't want anyone to be there, and I said, well, I'm going to let security know anyway so that right. they can be nearby. Um, I think right. she said it's a green Jeep. And uh, do we need to keep the key? How is it going to be? No, he's. they're going to do the exchange themselves, I guess. He's oh, going to pull I up. See. She's going to be outside. He's going to hand her the keys and then leave. Okay. But it is going to be green Jeep Liberty okay. pulling up there at 5. And I just let her know, like, expect for some security officers to be nearby. I'm not going to, okay. you know, tell them to go and talk to you and stuff, but they're going to be driving around Please. at least. It's good. Yes, that's okay. So again, the girl, um, she's picking up the key and yeah. uh, so we just don't need to do anything unless no. it's something abnormal happens. Exactly, yeah. And I'll radio you if we get a call. I told her to call if it gets weird. It'll be right in front of in the corner of the parking lot, but um, if you just want to keep an eye on the area, especially if you see it get strange, the the mom was really worried that her daughter was going to get hurt tonight. I don't think he's been physical in the past. They've never reported anything in the past, but uh -huh. her mom was really no, worried okay. that showing up. So I'll be watching that. However, later she talked to the dispatcher again and let her know that the plans had changed and that Roland was going to be dropping her car off at the stadium parking lot after all and requested a security escort. Hi. Um, so this is Lauren. We talked Hi, Lauren. Yeah, what's up? So, yeah, um, so there's kind of a change of plans. I'm actually going to the stadium to get my car. Okay. And I was wondering if I could get a ride to the stadium. That's it, okay. Definitely, definitely, yeah, for sure. We have um, a security officer that's just in charge of escorts tonight, so I could have him give you a ride. Do you want him to wait with you as okay. well when the car's getting dropped off? That would be great. Okay, yeah. definitely. Yeah, I'll just give him a heads up. I'll have him hang tight there, and then if you want to grab the keys or whatever, he'll just wait until you, like, get into your car and stuff and drive away and just make sure everything's okay, okay? Okay, sounds cool. good. Sounds good, Lauren. And then just give us a call back when you're ready to go down there, and we'll send him up there to meet you, okay? Okay, okay. sounds good. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. The independent review team would later note that there was a gap of communication between the security office and the police department. Apparently, they were two separate systems. So even though Lauren's calls were noted in the security system that she had requested an escort because of fearing for her safety, it was never relayed to the University of Utah Police or documented in their system. The University of Utah Police is a small force. There are only about 30 officers for the 1,500-acre campus 
um, it's quite a large campus. In fact, I don't know if I've ever seen an actual officer while on campus. I was trying to remember that. I've seen security and I certainly in the hell have seen the parking staff because they really love giving tickets. In fact, they gave me a ticket one day while I was walking to the meter. So they're quite efficient. Unfortunately, the police department in Lauren's case wasn't nearly as efficient. After Lauren retrieved her car, the harassing text messages got even worse. And so on October 12th, Lauren called the University of Utah Police Department and let them know about the situation. University Police and Security, how can I help you? Hi, uh, this is Lauren. I called a little uh, a few days ago about a situation and I wanted to kind of give an update and ask about some things. We're basically, so... Did you make a report? I, car, I did not. Okay, so you called a couple days ago about a situation you wanted to follow up on? Well, I guess it's kind of a different situation, but it's related in a way. Okay, but, so you, um, what I, you didn't make a report. Did you talk to a police officer? Um, I, well, so I had, I had a security person um, drive me to pick up my car. Uh-huh. Um, because I was I was worried about getting it, um, but um, so so what happened? What happened was that so I got the car and that was fine, but from one of my ex's friends. But so he and then some other. I've been getting these texts about from from these numbers that I um, of different people saying that they were saying that he was in the hospital and then saying that like. That he passed away but then but then i got a text from him and he seems to be alive so um and then they were i got a text about you know asking if i wanted to go to a funeral his funeral and i think they're trying to lure me somewhere so you got a bunch of texts seeming like they're trying to get you to go somewhere um first it was just saying okay, where did you receive the it was text kind of this, where do you live so i live at and when did this happen? Um, so the, the the latest one was today. When did it start? Um, y yesterday. At about what was time? when they were talk saying that he was the hospital. Um, it, um, I think around 7 p.m. And what time this afternoon was the last one? Um, it was a around around 3 p.m. 3 p.m. Okay. Yes. And this is all your ex's friends. Right. And are these just text messages? Yes. Okay, and are they threatening text messages? Um, well, most of them, no. But, um, I mean, they've, they've told me not to, not to go where he, at the club where he works, where he used to work. Okay, and is there a protective order between you guys, or is he just an ex of yours? Just an ex. Okay. And are you trying to avoid him? Um, or not necessarily? I, I would say it's, it's more just his friends. Okay. Will you spell your last name for me? Yes. Um, M-C-C-L-U-S-K-E-Y. What's your first name? Lauren, L-A-U-R-E-N. All right, what's a good phone number for you? All right, where are you right now? Right now I'm at home. Okay, and have you asked them to stop texting you? I have not, but I've I've blocked a few of the numbers already. All right. Um, I will send this through an officer uh, to give you a call. He's going to give you a call on that last phone number that you gave me. The phone. Is that okay? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, perfect. I'll have somebody call you shortly. Okay, thanks. All right, bye. The next morning, Lauren called the University of Utah Police again. She had received an email that told her if she did not pay $1,000 that some intimate photos of her and Roland would be released. Fearing for her reputation like anyone would, she paid the $1,000 but also called police. University of Police and Security, how can I help you? Hi, so I'm uh, dealing with a situation um, where I'm being black mailed for money um it's so a, a photo of my me and my ex they're um threatening to, to send it out to everyone mm -hmm. um and and she's asking for a thousand dollars and this is over text what did you say and this is over text message yeah well it's all right, where, where did you receive the messages at? 
Well, at first it was an email, and okay. then, um, and then over that app. Okay. Where were you at when you received the messages? Oh, no, you're uh, fine. At my apartment. Okay. Has this happened before, or has it been happening, or is this the first time? This is the first time. Okay. All right. There have been some harassment before. So it has happened before. Not not this particular um, type of thing. Okay. But you have had involvement with this person? Yeah. Okay. And do you know who this is? Um, so it's Sean Roland is the one messaging me. Is he, what's, what's your relation to him? My ex-boyfriend. Okay. Okay, and how long ago did this happen? This morning. Okay, do you know around what time? Um, the, the email was, um, around 6 or 7 a.m. Okay. All right, and do you know around what time the text came? Around 8. Around 8? All right, and can you tell me what his name is again? Yeah, it's uh, Sean Roland, S-H-A-W-N. And then his last name? R-O-W-L-A-N-D. Okay. And do you happen to know his date of birth? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Do you know how old he is? Uh, 37. Okay. Okay. I'm going to get your information, okay? Can you tell me your first and last name? Warren McCluskey. All right. So it looks like I have everything. What's going to happen is I'm going to let one of our officers know, and he's going to call you. It may come from a blocked number. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. All right, that should be happening shortly, okay? Okay. All right, thanks for calling. Thanks. Bye. She went to the station at about 11 a.m. with a friend to report the extortion, and Officer Miguel Darez took her report. A criminal check was requested at this time, but Roland's offender status for some reason didn't come up. However, his sexual offenses did come up. You would think that that would be enough to raise some red flags, but because... University of Utah police missed a notification letting them know that Roland was in violation of his parole. Nothing was done. In fact, officers insisted that it wasn't Roland who was harassing her through text messages. It had to have been a scammer. A friend would later say that it seemed like officers weren't taking her seriously. They were acting as though it was just like boyfriend problems. And the friend noted that instead of taking them into a private interview room, the officers talked to her in front of other officers. So it was quite awkward. While Lauren was at the police station, Officer Darez did contact a detective. The detective told Officer Darez to forward his report to her, along with screenshots of the text messages that Lauren had received and the transaction that had been made to keep the photos from being released. Officers also ran another check on Roland through the campus system and came up with a student who they mistook as Sean Roland. So there was a student with that same name and officers looked at the records and then told Lauren and her friend that he seems like a nice guy. Don't worry about it, was the overall message that it seemed that they were sending. Lauren left the police station at 1 p.m. that day and soon forwarded the information that was requested from her, including the screenshots of the text messages. One of the messages that Lauren forwarded to the officer stated, if you want to protect our image and dignity, contact me. Feel free to call the cops. That's how redacted including your family. So I'm assuming that's how I'm going to release them to everyone, including your family or something similar. At that time, Lauren also sent the photos that she was being blackmailed with to Officer Darez to include in her case. That information was then forwarded to the detective's email, but Lauren would not be contacted by that detective until the 16th. Lauren would call several more times within the next 10 days, and she would call quite a few times between the 13th and the 16th. I, I've been blackmailed um, for for money with threats of sending out me. Okay. Do you live her in Salt Lake or Sandy or Salt Lake City? 
or are you up on campus? I'm up on campus, okay. but it's, I guess the... So you live like on campus? Let's see. Up on campus. Okay. Let me go ahead and get you over. University of Police will probably take the case then, just one sec. I've, I've talked to them already, but okay. I just wanted to call you as well. Um, because usually, if you've already reported it, usually we just take it where you live, and then that agency does a case, because, like, if they make threats, the most likely they'll come is at your house, at your place. So you normally don't have to make multiple okay. reports. Did they tell you to call us? Or did they take a case and give you a case number? No, they didn't. Okay. But you already did talk to them and tell them about it, or...? Yeah, I was just concerned because I wasn't sure how long they were going to take to Are you in line for an officer to call you? Oh, file arrest. But they didn't give you a case number at all? Oh, I think they did. Hold on. Okay. Um, Do you want to talk to them and see kind of more about what's going on with your case? Um, I'm sorry, what was that? Do you want to talk to them to see what's going on with your case? Yes, there's a case number. Okay, let me get you up to them and so they can see what's going on with that. Just one moment. Okay. Thanks. I'll talk to them. University 911, what is your emergency? Hey, it's Sydney. She's got a case number pending, um, but she's receiving additional blackmail threats. She lives in Bill. This is all I got from her so far, but she does have a case number. She's on the line. Okay. So the case number is 18-1861. 18-61? Okay. Okay, give me one second, okay? Okay. Hi, are you still there? Yes. Okay, so I opened up your call from yesterday, is that correct? Yes, you did. Okay. All right. What's going on? Well, I, I came in earlier today, um, and I filled out a report for 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 the um, the threat um, or you know. Mm -hmm. You came. You came into our building. Yes, I did. Okay. Um, I wanted to. I I called nine one one because I was I was just concerned and I, I wasn't sure. I yeah. It might help speed things up. I don't know. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Okay. Yeah, if you call 911, the call will just come back to us and do the exact same okay. thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so... Do you know... Sorry. No, you can go ahead. Do you know when an arrest would be made? <clears throat> um, you can talk to an officer if you want. I can arrange that if you want that. Okay. Yeah, that, that sounds good. Okay, is that all you're wanting to know? Or did you want to add more onto your report? Um, that's all. Okay. Um, give me one second, okay? Okay. Thank you. During this time, Lauren actually reached out to her mom and she said that she felt like she was being a bother to the officers, to which her mom replied that that was their job to help her. So she shouldn't feel as though she was bothering them. Officers did tell her that they would be issuing an arrest warrant for Roland, but nobody bothered to follow up with her on the status of that. It would later be reported that Lauren reached out to the police department over 20 times in addition to the texts and phone conversations she had with Officer Darris and conversations, I believe, with the detective as well. So Lauren was in constant communication between the 12th and the 22nd with the police department. On October 16th, Roland's parole officer actually made contact with him. But because the University of Utah police had not reported, the parole officer was not notified about what was going on. These violations would have sent him back to jail. So it was a matter of people not paying attention to notifications at the University of Utah Police Department, and then also 
when the University of Utah Police Department pulled up Roland's name, it should have triggered a notification to the state, letting them know that someone was checking on Roland. But that notification apparently wasn't received either. So two separate systems failed. Again, later at the initial press conference, police chief Brophy would claim that after receiving the reports on Roland that U of U police officers weren't able to locate him. He said that he had walked away from a halfway house, but an employee with public safety said that this wasn't the case. He was living at the location on his record. So clearly they didn't really check. Also at this press conference, what really bothered me when I watched it was that they seemed to really praise officers and weren't very forthcoming from the beginning with the information. Between October 16th and 19th, the review noted that Lauren's detective was involved in other cases and failed to follow up with Lauren about her case. Lauren made a second call to the Salt Lake City Police Department after receiving a text message from Roland or his friends stating that they knew everything and they knew she had contacted police. And so she became very worried and contacted Salt Lake City Police. Uh, I'm worried because I've been working with the campus police um, at the U. Uh -huh. And uh, last Saturday I reported and I haven't gotten an update. Okay. But, but someone contacted me today, someone who was harassed and said that that they know everything about the police. Okay. So you already spoke to the campus police. Did some? Did this happen on the University of Utah campus? Yes, and they haven't updated or done anything. So the the case it involved extortion, and, and those people uh, are still chasing me. Okay. So have you have you notified the campus police about this? Yes, I have. Okay. And what prompted you to call Salt Lake City, please? Well, I thought it was weird that um, that, it, that there are people who know about the entire case and the harassers seem to know about it more than me. And I'm concerned there might be an insider um, who's letting them know about the, ca the case. Okay. So with some- Because I haven't gotten updates. Yeah. And it's been a week. Okay. With something like that, you would want to contact the campus police back and ask to speak to your detective. If you're concerned, you could ask okay. to a detective supervisor. Since it's another agency's area, the Salt Lake Police wouldn't be involved. Oh, okay. All right. And then make sure you tell them what you told me, that this is, this is getting through to you from the suspects in your case. Okay, so, so the, the detective you said is who I should contact? Right. Call the dispatch back and then ask to speak to your detective. Okay. Uh, sounds good. Thank you. All right. And then if anything happens or if you see them when you're like out and about in Salt Lake City proper, not audit on University of Utah property, and for something mm -hmm. like that, we'd be the best people to call. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right. At that point, her detective did reach out to her, but said that she would be off for the next few days. And so in the meantime, Lauren should forward any information on the case, any evidence to her email. On October 20th, Lauren sent several screenshots, including information regarding Roland's offender status to that email. And at about 10 a.m. on October 22nd, Lauren called the University of Utah police again. After receiving a message to call Lauren, Officer Darius did call her back at around 12 8 p.m. And at this time, Lauren informed him that she had received a text message from someone claiming to be the deputy chief at the University of Utah Police Department and that they wanted to meet with her. Officer Darris confirmed that this was not the case and told Lauren to ignore the message rather than pursuing this lead considering, oh, I don't know, the dude was impersonating a police officer. Like, that's a crime, right? Pretty sure that's a crime. Yep. Pretty sure. Not only did Darris not follow up on this new complaint 
but he also didn't notify anyone that it had happened. Also that day, there was a housing care meeting regarding the concerns that Lauren's friends and other housing staff had. This meeting had been rescheduled from October 8th. However, during the time between the 8th and the 22nd, there had been no follow-up from housing staff. So I think it was kind of one of those things where they were supposed to follow up on the 8th. uh, And then of course that meeting was canceled. And you would think by the 22nd, they would have done so and come up with a solution, but that didn't happen. They basically dropped the ball on that. Between 3 and 6 p.m. that day, Roland was spotted again on security camera footage several times. Apparently, he had gone to her residence hall while she was not there, and he was actually hanging out with her friends. Security camera footage shows him pacing the halls and then leaving the dorm at about 8.10 p.m. carrying a small black bag. That night, just before 8.20 p.m., Lauren was on the phone with her mother, and they were talking about her plans for the next day. She was on her way home from a night class, and when she got home, she was going to start studying, and it was a typical conversation. However, a few minutes into the phone call, her parents' worst nightmare came true. Her mother heard Lauren suddenly shout, no, 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 and a commotion that sounded as though she was being grabbed, after which there was silence on the line. Her mother called out to her several times, but there was no answer. Lauren's mother stayed on the phone waiting for a response, and in the meantime, her father called 911 from Washington. And I'm going to play this audio, and I want you to listen because you can hear Lauren's mother in the background also explaining what had happened. Security, how can I help you? Hi, is this the University of Utah? This is. How can I help you? Okay. This is a dispatch center in the state of Washington. I have a 911 call to transfer you. Hold on one moment, please. Okay. Sir, are you still there? Hi. Okay, you're on the phone with the dispatch for the University of Utah. Hi, this is my daughter. Hi, this is Chris with the Lauren University McCluskey. of Utah Police. Hi, my daughter, Lauren McCluskey, uh, was talking to her mom, and then she just started saying, no, 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 and... It sounded like someone might have been grabbing her or something. Okay. How long ago was this? This was just two, uh, two minutes ago. Okay. Joe, no, can you come down here? Does she live on campus? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Listen, listen. Okay, and what, what's her name? Lauren McCluskey. Okay, will you spell that last name for me? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, will you, will you spell the last name for me? Yes, M-C-C-L-U-S-K-E-Y. Okay. And you said the phone line went dead? Yeah, the phone line went dead. Okay, have you tried calling her back? No, I'm, I'm sorry, the phone is not dead, but but we can't, um, her, she must have dropped it and the phone connection is still here. It's, do you want the number or? Uh, yes, please, open. It's, oh, what? Okay, and do you happen to know what building or room number she lives in? Yes, but, well, um, what building is she? Her house, what, what building is she living in? Okay, she lives on the, um, it's, not, it's not Sage Point, but it's one of the other ones, building 830 something. Building, um, one of the factor. Okay, just, just concentrate there. Okay. So it's building, she was walking from GC 1570. Okay. To her car. Uh, to her car. All right. And what was your name? Pardon? What's your name? My name is Matt McCluskey. Okay. All right. She had broken up with a boy. Okay. Or a man. Sean Fields is his name. Okay. Has he made any threats or anything like that? Um, her, his friends were kind of harassing her a little bit. Well, they, they were. I can't say police were involved with that. Yes. 
Okay, I actually, I have an officer right here that dealt with that. Let me talk to him for one second. I'll be right back on with you, okay? I'll still be able to hear you, but you won't be able to hear me. Okay. I know, we have to concentrate on helping. Okay. So, so the officer's there who knows about his her situation. He's telling us to this. Okay. Yeah, keep it on. Could you um, could you go up and bring my cell phone because I gave him my phone number. Okay. It's uh, upstairs in my closet or on my nightstand in case they call that number. Okay, let's focus. All right, Matt, are you still there? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. All right, and you said she was walking to her car from what building? From the GC, which is, uh, what is that, something Commons. Gardner Commons? Oh, someone's talking on her phone. Hello? Hi, I have a backpack and I need a okay. phone. Okay, um, could you just uh, stay there? Uh, I think she was mugged. Um, is she okay? I was about to call the cops. Um, no, I'm talking to the cops. Okay. Now, but maybe somebody yeah. picked her backpack. Someone picked up her phone and backpack. I'm trying to get a good location. All right, where exactly? Where is that backpack out? Can you get a location for me? Yeah. Okay. Can you go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, I'm up on the edge of campus by the dorm. Hi, Matt. Are you there? Oh, yeah. I think he's. They're pretty. Um. It's right by her apartment. It's right by her apartment. I'm sorry. Please repeat that again. It's. I'm showing her apartment as. Yeah. And you said it's right by that building. Well, I think so. Um, maybe this girl should call the cops. Tell her to tell her to just call the cops directly. Does that would that be better? Yeah. Yeah. If she could call us directly, that would be awesome. I'm going to let you go, and if you hear anything. If you hear anything else, give us a call back, please. After speaking with the University of Utah Police, Matt called 911 again to talk to the Salt Lake City Police. Hi, um, my name's Matt McCluskey. Uh, my daughter is Lauren McCluskey, and she went missing tonight, and we reported it to the University of Utah Police. She's a student there. And I'm just make, I just want to make sure that you guys know about that. Um, so we wouldn't really need to, other than her being listed, um, she would be listed as a missing person on the national database if you made a missing persons report. But, okay. Um, otherwise, I mean, okay. there's not so, else, anything else. So, so this is, this is, no, no, okay. So this is more than that. She was abducted while we were talking to her on the telephone. Okay. So, so we heard her being assaulted and we called the uh, University of Utah campus police and I'm just calling you to let you know that this just happened like uh, an hour ago. And it's not just she went missing. Was it, was it they were in the view of Lancer? Um, could you please say that again? Was it that they were in that silver view of Lancer? Uh, I don't know anything about a silver Buick Lancer. Okay. Yeah. University let us know about it. We had our units. Okay. Um, we notified them as well. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right. Okay. At 8.32, police arrived on the scene where the backpack had been found along with Lauren's phone, but she was nowhere to be seen. At that point, police began searching for Lauren, and this included both the University of Utah Police and Salt Lake City Police. They searched her dorm first, and then they started searching the surrounding buildings and grounds. It wasn't until 9.55 that they found Lauren in the back of another car. Roland had grabbed her from her vehicle and dragged her to this vehicle, which he had brought onto campus. He shot her seven times. Lauren was just 21 one years old. At this time, a text message went out to students letting them know that they needed to secure in place and that there had been a shooting on campus. Police knew right away that Roland would be a suspect. They already had his information and so they sent out another alert after finding Lauren deceased 
That included Roland's information. At 1146, police determined that Roland was no longer on the campus and they sent another notification out letting students know that the order had been lifted. Meanwhile, after shooting and killing Lauren, Roland called a woman he had met online and asked her to pick him up, telling her that he was working out at the U. She picked him up and they went to dinner, drove by the Capitol, went back to her house where he showered. After he showered, he asked the woman to take him and drop him off at a local coffee shop. When she arrived home, she turned on the news and saw a picture of him, knew who he was, and immediately called the police. At 12.01 a.m., an alert was sent out again, officially naming Roland as the suspect. And around 12.46, Salt Lake City police found him and a foot chase began. They chased him into a local church. I believe he went in the back and officers went in the front. As they entered the building, they heard a gunshot and found Roland deceased. He had taken his own life. Within hours of Lauren's death, the University of Utah hired a PR firm and paid them $60,000 to deal with the fallout, which is, in my opinion, a shitty but expected thing to do. The following day, the University of Utah canceled classes and held a press conference at that time to update the public on what had happened. And it was in this press conference that Chief Brophy praised the actions of officers. Two days later, the University of Utah held another press conference. And at this time, Chief Brophy revealed the extortion case that was pending regarding Roland. He also revealed that Roland had been stalking Lauren on campus for three days prior to murdering her and that the day he murdered her, he was on campus for at least three hours hanging out with her friends. In my opinion, he made it appear that Lauren wasn't too concerned with her safety. Even though she had called, she had never indicated that she felt unsafe. We did believe uh, that Roland and or his associates both were threatening her financially and reputationally but there was no indication from Lauren, from Lauren to us at any point in this investigation that he was threatening physical harm. And that was evidenced by, oh, he can bring the car to my apartment. And I was wondering if I could get a ride to the stadium. That's yeah. okay. Do you want him to wait with you as okay. well when the car's getting dropped off? That would be great. Well, so I had, I had a security person um, drive me to pick up my car uh -huh. because I was, I was worried about getting it. And I think they're trying to lure me somewhere. He further went on to say that the man that had loaned Roland the gun had turned himself in. He bought the gun with a female. He actually purchased it and then she submitted the background check and then handed the gun over to him. Roland had paid him $400. He said he just wanted the gun to give to his girlfriend for protection. This man had no idea that Roland had planned to kill Lauren with it. At this time, the president of the University of Utah, Ruth Watkins, announced that there would be two independent reviews. One would be an overall review of the campus safety system to see if anything had gone wrong there. And another review would look at the actions overall of the departments involved. However, she did say at that press conference that the individual actions of officers would not be looked at. And this is something that you hear Chief Brophy talk about how they had all this confidence in these officers and they did not believe that the officers had made any mistakes. It seemed as though they were trying to almost victim blame, you know, that their officers were perfect. The following day, administrators had a closed door meeting with the public relations firm that they had hired, and they were trying to come up with solutions on how to approach the situation. Administrators didn't want to address Roland's violent past. Instead, someone mentioned that they should shame Lauren or victim blame her because she had broken housing policy by allowing him in her dorm to spend nights there, which is a total dick thing to do and should never happen, period, but especially not at a nationally credited university that claims it gives a shit. Dickhead award there on that person. Luckily, nobody listened to that fool. On December 17th, the Independent Review Committee released the findings of their report. The University of Utah held a press conference and at that time, President Watkins said this. The report does not offer any reason to believe that this tragedy could have been prevented. Instead, the report offers weaknesses, identifies issues, and provides us with a roadmap for strengthening security on our campus. I say a lot of stupid shit, but this has to go down as 
the most regrettable comment that woman has ever made. I'm sure it was something that she was told to say by the public relations firm or maybe the insurance company or the attorneys for the University of Utah, but it was still a dumb thing to say. And Lauren's mother said upon hearing this that she became physically ill because they knew the truth. They knew that Lauren's death could have been prevented. And in fact, the independent review made it clear that several mistakes had been made. They highlighted the lack of coordination, not only between the security office and the university police department, but also between Salt Lake City Police and the University of Utah Police. They noted that there were several deficiencies in housing and that the concerns regarding Lauren's safety should have been escalated much sooner and to the correct parties than they were. Even though this review didn't focus on the actions of the officers, it did note that the detective assigned to Lauren's case did leave for her days off without assigning anything to any other detectives to follow up on. She had told Lauren to email her, but never checked her emails during this time. And if she had, the outcome may have been different. The review also noted that the department was understaffed, that it had no victim's advocate, which may have also helped it also blamed mistakes on training issues. The report recommended 30 changes to the use safety protocols. Other failures in the case that the report mentioned included the failure to check Roland's offender status and the notifications that were ignored regarding that status to which the University of Utah Police responded that they didn't have the manpower to follow up on those things all the time and they didn't know why that notification was missed, which that's a pretty big fucking oversight. The report's final summary stated, we understand that this analysis is retrospective and it was important to us to be continually mindful of this fact as we discovered new information and pieced together the case after the outcome was known. Nevertheless, and notwithstanding the good faith of everyone involved, we believe there is much to be learned from this tragic situation. Melvin Sean Rowland was an evil, violent, manipulative, predatory sex offender who took the life of a promising young woman. He misled many people. He had multiple ideas identities, plausible storylines, and charm. We know more now in hindsight than was known, and in some cases could have been known at the time these events were occurring. We now see the links and connections. We now know his motivations and his intent, and we know the tragic outcome. We have based our findings on what was known by whom and when they knew it. We have based our recommendations on what we know now. As we examine the totality of this troubling event, we discovered that there were several indications that Lauren McCluskey was in trouble. Had victim advocates been engaged, Lauren might not have been left to assess the dangerousness of her situation on her own. There were shortcomings both systemically and individually. There were several instances where the lack of coordination was evident with UUPS, within housing, and among various campus departments. While the university has developed systems and programs to respond to student welfare issues, those systems were not engaged or utilized. UUPS officers should have checked on Roland's parole status. The UUPS detective involved in the investigation of Lauren's case should have asked Entertained his parole status when she had evidence that he was a convicted felon and the victim in her statement identified Roland as a suspect. Additionally, state systems to alert officers as to an offender status with APMP did not function as they were designed. UUPS seemed to lack the knowledge and awareness of these systems. In the final analysis, we will never know that this tragedy could have been prevented without these deficiencies. What we can say is that correcting the issues we have identified in this report might lessen the probability of such a tragedy occurring again. President Watkins has asked us not only to review, but to recommend what the university and its departments might do better in the future. We sincerely hope this report will be helpful to that end. In response to Lauren's murder, several bills were introduced. One of the bills introduced required detailed response plans and camp to safety measures. The bill under consideration will, if enacted into law and executed vigorously, remedy many of the systemic failures that were identified and exposed by this a terrible event. On what would have been Lauren's 22nd birthday, February 12, 2019, President Watkins announced significant changes had been made on campus as a result of the independent review. However, she repeated that no officers would be disciplined for their actions in the case. This understandably upset Lauren's parents who had asked for the officers in the case to be disciplined and wanted the university to apologize for the negligence that led to their daughter's death. In March of 2019, the detective in Lauren's case, Detective Dalif, was fired, but not because of what happened in Lauren's case, because of another case 
where a 17 year old had been threatened and held in a dorm room by a male student at the University of Utah. She failed to act in this case, which led to her firing. After she was fired, she ended up getting a job with the Weber County Sheriff's Office. On June 5th, the University of Utah held an awards ceremony for the campus police department, praising the actions of one of the employees, a dispatcher who had helped Lauren and her mother on October 10th, as well as two administrators. Lauren's parents were disgusted and said that it bordered on obscene considering all of the mistakes that had been made in Lauren's case and the fact that the U had refused to apologize for what had happened. The university quickly apologized for that mistake, which I'm like, duh. Later that month, after months of watching the U mishandle their case and refuse to work with them, Lauren's parents filed a lawsuit as a last resort. They requested $56 million from the University of Utah. The lawsuit alleged that Lauren's death was avoidable and that by ignoring Lauren's pleas for help, the U had violated her Title IX rights. Now, a lot of people will criticize victims for filing high dollar lawsuits, but the fact is the only way to get change is to file lawsuits and cause companies, organizations, institutions to change practices and policies, which unfortunately does not happen unless there is a financial penalty involved. It really bothers me that we villainize victims. The McDonald's case is a prime example of that. They still use that as a story about this lady that burned herself with hot coffee at McDonald's and then sued them for millions of dollars. If you've Googled the pictures, they're pretty fucking horrifying. And all she wanted was for them to pay for her medical care and they drug it out in court over and over and the dollar amount went up because you have to pay for attorneys. Uh, interestingly, companies like McDonald's did in this situation, they hire these PR firms and advertising to smear victims. That's pretty fucking disgusting. So I don't like the criticism that, oh, they sued for all this money. Lauren's mother being an economics professor and asked someone that minored in it, I would have double majored, but I was not going to take it econometrics knew this because it's very common to run risk assessments. Companies will do that and they know that there are risks to certain policies and procedures and not taking action, but they'll do it anyway because the chances of a lawsuit are less than the cost to implement the changes. And I'm not saying that's what happened with the University of Utah, but that is something that happens. Lauren's parents, when they announced the lawsuit, made it clear that they would not profit from the lawsuit. The money would go to improving campus safety. Shortly after Lauren's parents filed their lawsuit. Officer Miguel Darris was disciplined for mistakes he made in another case. Again, not Lauren's case. He had a warning placed in his file. He ended up resigning a few months later and getting a job with the Logan Police Department. In July of 2019, Chief Brophy decided to retire and did so keeping a salary of $150,000 for a year of severance. He was thrown a $6,000 retirement party and he received full retirement so he got a pretty good deal, in my opinion. So to recap, that detective and officer in Lauren's case that fucked up were actually never disciplined for what happened in Lauren's case. They were disciplined for what happened in other cases. Kind of bullshit, right? On September 21st, the University of Utah filed a response to Lauren's parents' lawsuit stating that because they were not an individual, they could not be sued and that no matter how tragic... Lauren's death was. They could not be held responsible because Roland was not a student at the U and therefore they had no obligation to protect Lauren, which doesn't make any damn sense. On October 21st, one day before the first anniversary of Lauren's murder, 200 students walked out of class to protest the administration's actions or lack of action in the case. President Watkins responded by saying that the investigation had revealed problems on campus. Like, no shit, Sherlock Sally. Valley. The following day, which was the anniversary of Lauren's death, the university reported to the media that it had made significant changes to campus safety. In November of 2019, the Salt Lake Tribune released an investigative report of the culture of the University of Utah police. The article highlighted the way victims were treated by officers and the long history of the police department's mishandling of concerns. It highlighted the department's tendency to ignore allegations, victim blame, and the culture of hesitancy to believe 
three victims and the complaints. The article interviewed both victims and former officers. One former officer described her interaction with the victim in which another officer questioned that victim about what she was wearing, what type of vodka that she had bought, if she loved the man who raped her, and if she'd been a virgin before the rape. Other reports from women who were victims of intimate partner violence talked about being neglected for days. One victim reported being raped in her dorm room in 2006. Officers didn't take her seriously and they actually stopped investigating after a month they closed the case. In another example, there were four women that reported being raped by one suspect. That suspect wasn't investigated until the fourth report. In response to the article being published, the now retired Chief Brophy stated that he didn't believe much of what was in that report and then dismissed the reports by former officers as just a matter of bitter ex-employees. Fuck him for that. Seriously. On January 9th of 2020, the U hired a new police chief, Ronnie Chapman. Shortly after they announced they had hired Chief Chapman, they announced a $13 million facility that would be built for the police department. Stick a pin in that number. In May of 2020, the Salt Lake Tribune reported that Officer Darris had shown the photos of Lauren to other officers for non-work related purposes. According to the report, Darris had bragged that he could look at them anytime he wanted. And when he had shown them to the other officers, they had made crude comments. Now, his attorney claimed that he had only shown these photos to other officers involved in the investigation and an internal review seemed to come to the same conclusion. Here's my impression of the internal review. Hey, Officer Darris, did you show any other officers pictures of Lauren McCleskey? Oh, uh, only in the investigation, like not outside of it. Okay, all right. Later, Chief Chapman, who had questions regarding the thoroughness of that internal review, ordered another review. At that point, the U announced a complete overhaul of their police department. Probably a good idea, considering on August 5th, 2020, the Department of Public Safety released a report that, yeah, Officer Darov had shown these intimate photos to other officers for unrelated work purposes. In fact, one of the officers was shown that picture the night that Lauren was murdered after he wondered what she looked like. On October 22nd, 2020, Lauren's parents, along with the University of Utah, announced that they had reached a settlement in the lawsuit. As part of the agreement, the University of Utah apologized for what had happened to Lauren and admitted their liability. On behalf of the entire University of Utah community and myself personally, I want to express how sincerely sorry we are for the McCluskey's profound loss of their daughter, Lauren, a stellar student, a gifted athlete, and a person we were honored to have at the University of Utah. The University acknowledges and deeply regrets that it did not handle Lauren's case as it should have, and that, at the time, its employees failed to fully understand and respond appropriately to Lauren's situation. As a result, we failed Lauren and her family. The University of Utah agreed to pay $13.5 million, $10 million of which would come from the insurance company. This settlement is important for many reasons. It addresses how Lauren died, but it also honors how she lived. All the money from the settlement will go to support the Lauren McCluskey Foundation missions, which include campus safety, animal welfare, and amateur athletics. We are honored that she will always have a presence on the campus. We are also honored that her name will be associated with the Center for Violence Prevention. We applaud what the Center for Violence Pre Prevention stands for and what they're doing. Most of all, we have hope for the future, and we hope not only that the University of Utah is a safer place, but that campuses will be safer nationwide because of what we are doing with the foundation. Thank you all. The university also pledged to build an indoor track bearing Lauren's name by December 31st of 2030 as part of the settlement. $3 million would go to the Lauren McCluskey Foundation to improve campus safety nationwide. Shortly after this was announced, coincidentally, the University of Utah 
police chief Chapman on leave. According to the attorney general's office, they were unsure if it was illegal that he had brought a gun onto campus and a badge before he was certified. Now, Chief Chapman admitted to bringing a gun on campus, which is not illegal, but not the badge. So it was like an invented, in my opinion, an invented a reason to remove him. And basically, they were pissed that Chief Chapman wanted transparency in Lauren's case, and they were punishing him for it in my opinion. In March of 2021, state lawmakers approved the settlement amount for Lauren's family. In April of 2021, the Salt Lake Tribune reported a notice of claim had been filed by Chief Brophy and Officer Miguel Darris, along with two other officers. These officers claimed that they had been scapegoated and thrown under the bus by the University of Utah. Chief Brophy claimed he hadn't been treated fairly, the parties claimed that they had been mistreated by the University of Utah and were seeking $10 million. I'm not sure if anything has happened since then, but that's a dick thing to do. Like, really? You're mistreated? Like, bullshit. In June of 2021, the University of Utah finally cleared Chief Chapman, but they did not reinstate him. He later took a job at Brown University, which is a hell of a lot better than the U, and did file a lawsuit against the university seeking I believe it was 10 million at first and then it dropped to 2.5 million, which I think you should have gone for the 10, dude. Like you got royally fucked. In addition to the creation of the Lauren McCluskey Foundation, the McCluskeys donated $1 million to the University of Idaho for a new indoor track. Lauren had trained at the university while she was growing up, which did not have an indoor track, which can I tell you how awesome it is that they donated that to the University of Idaho? And then they're like, you can pay for your own track, University of Utah. Also, I don't know if this was planned or not, but I think it's interesting that the U announced 13 million would be spent on, you know, their new police station. And that was the exact amount that the McCluskeys settled for. Not sure if that was on purpose, but it's kind of a cool coincidence. According to its website, the Lauren McCluskey Foundation is dedicated to honoring the life and spirit of Lauren McCluskey by bringing awareness to funding research for and providing resources to change the cultures that respond poorly to dating violence and stalking on campuses. Unfortunately, it appears that the University of Utah did not follow through with its promises because in 2022, another student, Ji Dong, was murdered off campus. The same failures that were responsible for contributing to Lauren's murder were also present in Ji case. So, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. You can check out the Lauren McCluskey Foundation via the links below and find out more about the foundation's work and its future plans. You can also learn about ways to become involved to improve campus safety on college campuses. All right, so that's it for now. I will be uploading Jifan's story within the next couple of days, and I encourage you to look out for that and remember who you are and what you stand for. And hopefully that's not protecting your reputation before caring about the safety of your students and taking action so that it doesn't fucking happen again. Alrighty. Remember Lauren Jennifer McCluskey. Remember how she lived. Remember how she died. Senate Bill 134, Campus Safety Amendments by Senator Iwamoto. This bill was heard in education with a vote of 904. The House sponsor is Representative Snow. We all know about an incident that occurred here on the University of Utah campus with one of the young students who attended a tragic, uh, a, a real tragedy. I can tell you that uh, uh, when Lauren McCluskey, who was the student who was tragically killed, when her father attended that meeting and testified, uh, I, I, it's probably the most emotional meeting that I've attended thus far. Seeing all those present having voted, voting will be closed. Senate Bill 134 passes this body with 67 yes votes and two no votes and will be Signed by the Speaker, returned to the Senate for the signature of the President.